exploring the essence of the sensuous earth, fascinated with fire, enraptured with water. energies and elements of the world without to create from the world within. Through his work, an artist explores unique self, unique vision and unique soul. The artist confronts the mythological muse, struggling with life's primordial forces to evoke the transcendent, the refined, the sublime, and the beautiful. Only when talent fuses with command of craft a second nature can the discovery emerge, yet remain open to the accidental and the unknown. American achievement in ceramic art has been surveyed in this long overdue exhibition organized by the Everson Museum of Art in Syracuse, New York. An exciting retrospective of enormous scope and consequence. The significance of this exhibition, a century of ceramics in the United States, 1878 to 1978, is that it brings together, it documents for the first time, 100 rather glorious years of progress in the development of a ceramic art aesthetic in the United States, brings together many of those pioneers who have created a unique American art form out of this particular expression that man has created out of earth, fire and water. Spurred on by the early women's art movement, American art pottery developed in Cincinnati. And it was also in Cincinnati that Rookwood, the first American pottery to achieve international acclaim, was established. Ceramics among the ancient Mediterranean and Asian cultures consisted of functional and religious objects. Today, while the aesthetic directions of artists have changed, Ceramic objects retain the power to transport us into their orbit and beget an endless energy. For the artist who works in clay, the act creation is a trial by fire. As Gauguin once said, a pot that survives the hell of firing is like a man who is both purged and reborn. <laughs> Adelaide Robineau is best known for her famed scarab vase, also known as the thousand hour vase, for that was reputedly the length of time it took to create this piece. In this exhibition, 
we see tremendous changes in style. We see the growth from the bow art style of the Rookwood pottery in the first three decades. We see a looseness growing in the 1930s with the influence coming from the Wiener Werkstatter. Victor Schreckengust and Idris Eckhart, more than any other artists of the Depression era, typify the decorative response of ceramic sculptors to the issues of the day. My whole training was the coordination of not only form, but the form and the color, the texture, the decoration, and its use had to be one, one concept, not, not just to use clay for its own sake and see how, how I can break it, things of that sort. If there was a reason to break it, fine, but not just to destroy everything. And I have no patience with anybody that uses lacquer or anything else. The, the infinite varieties of things that you can do to, to make a change of clay. The jazz bowl was one of the, the first things I did at Cowan Pottery. An order was in for something New Yorkish, jazzy, and uh, I started to think of New York and the lights and the follies and all the things, of the real jazz age. And I developed a scraffito method of putting black clay on white body and then co coloring it with a, a, a clear Egyptian blue glaze gave almost a moonlight look to it. Well, I was always interested in getting some base and some reason for doing what I was doing. And I looked, I was crazy about mythology and folklore and anything. And I, re I wondered where, where did this word come from, Karamos? And I found that he was a god. And the story went that Tasius, by the help of Ariadne, uh, killed the Minotaur of Crete. And then he got out and he left his fair assistant, Ariadne, on the Isle of Crete. I was in Europe in the late 30s and saw the beginning of the war. And so I decided to make the dictator. And it's Nero, while Rome burns, with the British lion sound asleep at his feet and the four little dictators trying to crawl up into the seat. And I was criticized for mixing politics with ceramics and art. But then when nothing happened, I decided to do it one more time. So by now the whole thing had broken open. And I decided to what what would best record I would suggest that and I remembered the apocalypse, death and all the things traveling. So I made four men on the horse. And I had the German army was the one thing that held the whole thing together. can foresee just whole new areas with the new technology and all of firing we could just do some gorgeous stuff with color and crystals and seeing sheer sections things of that sort I'm really excited about going back when I finished graduating from school in sculpture and I got a 50-year scholarship there at the art school I decided that I wanted to study with the man who in this country was doing the most ceramics and was doing very interesting work and that happened to be Alexander Akapenko. So I went to New York for a year and studied with him. I was director of ceramics in Ohio on uh, the WPA project and we were doing work for the libraries and the schools and we were doing children's story materials by request from the library 
and Mrs. Roosevelt heard about me because our project became known from New York to San Francisco, clear up to Portland, we were sending work. And she was very interested in what we were doing, so she came down to see me. And she asked me if I would do a huckleberry fin for her, life size, for Hyde Park. But it's really in the 1950s that we have what we can call a truly American style, a break away from some of the stylistic chains that had bound the ceramists in the United States to much of the art of Europe. And of course we have to thank that many artists, particularly Peter Volkus and the group of artists that gathered around him at the Otis Art Institute. The changes took place for a number of reasons, partly because the artist decided to become more expressionist with the material to play in the way that the abstract expressionist painters had. Peter Volkos, who has been the most radical force in adjusting the Western perception of the vessel, introduced asymmetrical form as a provocative, energetic treatment of the surface. I, I become very proud when it comes to my work because I deal with myself still. I came out of a painting background, you know, um, trying to paint and I'm having a difficult time. I find clay. You concentrate on that ball of mud. It's this big. And you keep that thing moving until you can relate to it. And then I have to work with it, you know. I have to expand on that. And this is what I'm interested in. I'm interested in a head trip. I'm not interested. I don't allow people to make functional wear in my class. I throw it out. We just throw it out. I don't teach them about art. I'm trying to teach them about themselves. I'm trying to teach them about form. And if they don't understand form, they can't make decisions. I want them to get to the point where they can make decisions, and then they can be free. I'm going to write down. I listen to a lot of music. I come and go. Half the time, I, I, I sit around listening to cowboy music. Play Willie Nelson. I listen to flamenco, which is a sort of a gypsy uh, cowboy shit, you know, like they're playing now. I listen to Bach. That's what I listen to. My energies come from a lot of different areas. I, I travel around in my truck. I look at machinery. I look at this and that. That, that interests me. I look at other artwork. Um, what I'm doing is gathering information, you know, visually through my ears and taking all these sensibilities into account, you know. I work with students, with people, and when it comes to the point when I have to let all that go, then I have to do something. It gets down to the point where I have to make art, or whatever you want to call it. Um, that's what keeps me sane, you know. And I can find myself in that thing. It might be at two or three o'clock in the morning, you know. It might just last for a few moments. That's a very important thing to me, you know. I have to find myself, keep in contact with all that all of the time. And I, you know, and it comes in, I have to be able to center myself, so to speak. I've got to be on top of that. And all these other things are coming into me as they should. I hope that I, I'm an aware person so I can take the, this information in. And it has to come out in the forms that I choose, whether it's uh, making clay objects, or painting, pouring metal, making bronzes, welded steel, prints, drawing, anything. And then that gives me another perspective on things. I mean, all these things are coming in, and then it has to come back out again. What goes out comes back in. The idea of Jackson Pollock, who completely changed our structure of what we thought space was about. You know? It became completely free. Art is that thing that I can never quite figure out myself. <laughs> if I knew what it was, I'd probably quit. That's that thing I'm looking for all the time. I'm looking for what I don't know. There again, it's just another word. 
and I I abolish all those terms. You know, I just don't pay any attention to art. What's art? What's ceramics? What's sculpture? I'm thinking of. I mean, all these things are a way of getting to your mind again. You know, whether you use clay, which is a ceramic material, or steel, bronze, paint, um, sound, movement, like a dance dancer, to get to that. It makes some sort of sense to you why you're here. What what are you? It keeps me straight, you know. Uh, tells me who I am, what I don't know. Art is probably means the things I don't know. Really, uh, it's very difficult. I mean, is it ultimately it gets down to a feeling? I can't explain it. Uh, I just don't have that capability. The American artist working in the multi-sensuous medium of ceramics releases those universal responses deep within us while drawing on resources from the ancient past to the fast-changing present. Pete Bocas was my teacher, probably the most important teacher I ever had. Not in the usual sense, but one who gave me the direction that I have today. Pete was an important person, really important in the um, history of contemporary ceramics. I even like to date ceramics uh, as before Volkus and after Volkus. Before Volkus, we were mostly concerned with pottery in a traditional sense. After Volkus, it became another art media. It was elevated from just the concern of function to an investigation of, of art. Black mountain rising from the earth Mountain build the blood and dirt Paul Soldner popularized Raku in this country, a technique that more than any other exploits the immediacy, the finished object emerging from the kiln minutes after its decoration. Against the world of God and day. Clay can take many, many different uh, shapes because it's soft when you first use it. And because it's soft, you can press things into it. Filling earth and heaven with sin, dead, cold. Black brown. I guess in the end, all approaches are valid. Um, one just becomes comfortable, more comfortable with one approach than another. Whatever works is uh, what an artist works with. Hangs one lone man with a crown. If there's a definition, one way to make pottery by a particular technique, then you're stuck and you can't grow, which has to do with a certain kind of freedom, the same kind of freedom I associate with authority. If it's well done, it seems very simple, very beautiful. Single hope for black mountains and... Another development that distinguishes the 1970s is a new direction in the relationship between ceramic art and painting. Much of this energy has come from Marja Huto. Working with the fan format evolved over about a five-year period. I used to work with plate forms and bowl forms where there were, was a lot of painting, a lot of landscape kind of effect. Later, when I did the new works in clay projects in 1975 and 76 and worked with painters Helen Frankenthaler, Larry Poons, and so on, I realized that the clay didn't always have to be in uh, vessel format, but it was all right to leave it flat. And I began to work with these slab forms, still in kind of a landscape look. And one day the fan just happened in my studio. When I decide on the colors for the fan, it begins when I first mix the clay. Each batch of clay is very special. A lot depends on how I feel that day. I guess what you would call work of the moment. I get very involved in the piece. I get lost in the piece.
My work is very different in the winter time than in the summer time. It's incredible. I'm a, very much affected by the atmosphere. Some of the changes that have, a, have occurred in clay, even in the last five years, that I notice a great deal. For one is just the acceptance on a wider scale by, shall I say, the general public. Just a couple of years ago, the gallery, like in New York City, the Andre Emmerich Gallery, would not have dreamed of handling my pieces. Clay is becoming more and more accepted as a major medium, just the way painting and sculpture is. And I very much believe that when you're working in a particular medium, you should do what that medium does best. I mean, it has a, um, a language of its own. Now, I've been working uh, with my head as a subject matter for about 10 years, <laughs> using my head, literally. I see the head, I see my face as, as a plastic vehicle, and why I use my own is because, of course, it's uh, cheap. And secondly, I can abuse it in some way. I can play with it in front of a mirror, like we're sitting here, move it around, push my nose over here, and Stick my finger up here and watch how that nostril makes a big roll up over there. Very interesting the way you can you know, do that. Or stick the tongue out and see certain tensions and stress that you get in the muscle. I'm trying to do other people now or certain mythological types and particular types, but uh, I haven't abused them in the sense that I've abused myself. I don't mind doing that. One can take liberties with oneself. One sometimes doesn't do it with others. Robert Arneson was the father of the 60s funk movement, introducing a tongue-in-cheek spirit of anarchism to the once precious field of ceramic sculpture. The toilet, anyway, came about out of the same attitude of, of breaking away and making an object that represented what I, at the time, figured was to be the Western culture's contribution to ceramics. Prior to that, my work would be categorized as abstract expression of ceramics, uh, the mastodon school of droppings. And um, I was working so much under the influence of Pierre Volkis and John Mason and, and, and the people that were uh, certainly my influence. My work, as opposed to other functional potters' work, is movement from function to non-function, which exists within the individual pieces. Betty Woodman's vessels exhibit a strong respect for both the elements of traditional pottery and the concerns of contemporary ceramics. The time we spend in Italy has, has a lot to say, you know, is reflected in my work. I think the strong influence that my work has has been one of the Mediterranean tradition of clay. Many potters continue to use function in its most abstract sense as a poor metaphor for personal expression, as can be seen in a series of cover jars by Robert Turner, Susan Stevenson, and Wayne Higby. This abstraction continues in Kenneth Price's cup series where the vessel takes on a sculptural, non-utilitarian quality. Among the noted painters and sculptors who have been attracted to ceramics are Louise Nevelson, Roy Lichtenstein, Anthony Caro, Isamu Noguchi, Kenneth Noland and Helen Frankenthaler. Artists such as these are joining the ceramist lead in breaking down the divisions between art and craft and are so creating a new role for the ceramists of tomorrow.
exploring the essence of the sensuous earth. The future for American ceramic art is going to be a very exciting one because the American ceramist has been able to introduce a, a whole new vocabulary in terms of handling clay. Up until now and for largely for the last three centuries, the Western view of ceramics has been largely to make it through the eye and the mind. With the American ceramist, we see a greater trust of the body. There's a physical response. There's an intuition. There's what Harold Rosenberg calls an unfocused play with material that has taken ceramics from the applied arts and made it a very important contribution to the fine arts, to the cultural heritage of this country. demand of the future is explicit. Ceramics, so long an art of evolution, needs to find a revolutionary voice. As we examine the work of the past 100 years and the culminating decade, the medium has never been more equal to the challenge. <laughs> 